The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning, family of God. It is good to be back from the sabbatical that I've been on. My heart is full of love to Christ and full of love to you, His bride. I report back with an increased desire to be faithful unto Him and the strength that He alone supplies at any cost to shepherd the flock of God and to keep my own heart and to guard my teaching. And my time away was healing in, in a thousand different ways. God was kind to me and did more than I could hope, ask, or think. And I, I just feel so uh, healed up. I pray that you'll see the fruit of a man more dependent on Christ with a closer walk with thee. So I want to thank my fellow elders for all that they did to make that possible, and to this body uh, for loving Laura and I so much during this season. She wanted me to express her gratitude just for your kindnesses in so many ways to, to help us uh, during this time to refresh and regroup. So we, we love you dearly and are grateful for you, and uh, let's go to our God and, and pray and worship to the declared Word of God this morning. Father, I come before you and I thank you that you've given us the Word of God. I pray now that we would come with a reverence, that we don't open up Mark Twain or some human writer. God, we open up the inspired Word of God where every word in it is your God-breathed truth. And so, Lord, let us have a reverence for that. Let us worship you for what we're about to see revealed of your heart toward us in this Word. God, I pray, let our minds be instructed. Let every heart be uh, inflamed with affection for you. And every will would say, take my life and let it be consecrated. Lord, to thee, God, would you do what no human being can do now and meet us and let us worship you through this word, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I've been praying for self-control. Um, my heart is full. It's bad to give a guy like me a vacation. Um, so is the slide up? Put the slide up. There's a warning. <laughs> Okay, rest in the Word of God, or just look out. So ready, as I thought quite a bit and prayed about all that God has taught me over the season, I just want to share it with you this morning, and it was difficult because there, there's just so many areas of what God was teaching me in this season, and yet there was this one overarching principle that just God just kept moving me to and aligning me with. And so this morning, I want to just give you a snapshot of what the Lord has been teaching me and really transforming my own heart with. And I'm just praying it'll do the same for you this morning. So I want to bring you into my sweet blessings that God has given to me. So I guess first, I should kind of give you a lay of the land, uh, where we're going as a church over the next few months. And so we got Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's coming up, and I decided then for the next six to seven Sundays to, to freelance. That's kind of what I did before sabbatical when we finished Second Peter. So we're just going to freelance until the, the new year. And then in the new year, I got a beautiful surprise of what God has led me 100% of what we're going to study through next, and I'm going to save that for the new year, but it's Romans. It's Romans. <laughs> Awakenings, revivals, the history of the world, that's the book. 20 years ago I preached it and I just want to come back to Romans and, and seek his face together in that book. So this morning, if you would turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, and I want to look at the first two verses with really a, a particular emphasis on one part of simple phrase this morning. And this is a passage, it's a, it's a running metaphor, which he says is the Christian life. And when you get saved, there, there's a race that you are to run to get to glory. And so all of us are in this Christian race running to King Jesus. The race has been set before us. We all have a race that has been given to us in the Christian life. And the writer here says you are to run it all the way to the finish line. And the finish line is Christ and all of his magnificent glory. There's never been a better finish line in any race that you've ever run. The finish line is the fullness of Jesus Christ. And every one of us have this race then set before us and we must run it. And we're called to help each other to run this race. It's a community project. You must run it, but we're all here to help each other make it to the finish line. 
It isn't, I just want to beat you. I want to run with you. I want you to finish with me. And many of you have hit some hard parts in your race. You've got shin splints. I hate those. Cramps and asthma. And your next step is just a miracle of grace. And some of you are just getting started and you got so much zeal and you bounce in here and I love it. And some of you are getting close to finishing your race and you just want to do cruise control and God wants you to run to the very end. Whatever you're sitting here this morning, every one of us have a race that's been set before us by God. It's been handpicked by God, decreed by God. Romans 8, 28, where we left off when I was here is that God works all things for good. And so there's a God who's working in our lives to conform us to Christ. And that's the race that we must run. And you can sit and spend all your days wishing that you had a different race, a different track, a different scenery. But it's God's scenery. It's God's race for you. You can grumble about it. You can sit down and just say, I'm done. You can walk off the track and just say, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Or you can take this exhortation from the writer of Hebrews through the Holy Spirit, and you're called to run this race that has been set before you. Because it's the only way to the finish line. No one gets to the finish line and will ever say the race was not worth the reward. That will never happen. So if Christ wasn't at the end of it, go ahead and quit. I don't care. But Christ is at the end of this, so you can't quit. And you got to run the race that has been set before you, no matter what the scenery or what is going on in your life right now. There's a race that must be run. Let us run it. The writer says, see to it in in the next chapter that none of you come short of the grace of God. Don't let anybody come short of this. And so my first point is your race was given to you by God and you receive it and you marvel that you stand in grace, the grace of God, and you've got to run that race that has been given to you to get the prize, which is Christ, the sweetest prize that anyone could ever get. And I want to run it because of what's at the end of it. And so I want to encourage you this morning to run the race that is set before you. Let's look at our text. Hebrews 12, 1. It says, therefore. Anybody forget how much I liked that word while I was gone? <laughs> I want it on my tombstone. I love that word. I've told you before, the whole, the whole gospel, the whole Bible is tied together by a therefore. And so all of Hebrews 1 through 11, all the, the beauties of Christ, uh, they're finished. It's a beautiful work. Therefore, I want you to run the race that is set before you. The whole context of this letter is being tied with the word therefore. And it's been a a really tough time on the church. A great persecution has come upon them. The Jews were coming to faith in Christ and they've professed that he's their Lord. And now persecution is coming from Judaism and it's becoming great. They're being kicked out of synagogues, families, and and now they're apostatizing. They're, They're walking away from Jesus and going back into Judaism. And so the writer is coming to try to help and cure this. And he's showing these believers, look at the superiority of Jesus Christ. Don't go back to shadows. We've come to the substance. Don't go back there. We have the fulfillment. It's all in Christ. It's all the whole temple has been torn into the veil because he's finished the work. He's superior to angels to the devil, to Moses, to the house that was built. He gives a superior rest in chapter 4, a superior high priest, promise, Melchizedek, a better covenant, a better sacrifice that's one time and forever. And he just shows them again and again from every angle, Jesus Christ is superior to anything back in Judaism. And thus you will have a superior walk because of the beauties of this Christ. Hebrews just shows you that Christ is beautiful and altogether lovely. Is he not? Throughout the book, he's exhorting them then, the saints who are not running the race that's set before them. They're weary, they're tired, they're meandering. It says in this chapter, their hands are weak and their knees are feeble. He says in chapter 2, I think it is, don't drift. Don't neglect so great of salvation. Don't become lazy. In verse 5, 12, he said, you should be teachers 
by now. You should know how to teach your wife, your children, your neighbor, your friends, and you're still drinking milk because you're, you're coasting. You, sh you should be growing up. You should be maturing in this race and running that, that's been set before you, and you're just choosing infancy. Come on, go forward and run, and aren't you sick and tired of just being apathetic? That's what he's saying, run the race. It's been set before you, quit coasting. You need to run, he says, with endurance. That Greek word is hupo, meno, and meno means to abide or to remain, and hupo, under. And so you need to run the race with hupo, meno, where you abide under all the pressures and the weaknesses and the struggles and the temptations. There's a million things trying to get you off this race, to go off the track and sit in the stands. And it's all tempting you. And he says, you've got to run it with endurance. You can't let go of Jesus Christ. Don't let go. You need endurance. It gets hard. It gets tiring. There are a million things fighting this. And so we need endurance. I've got to abide under everything squeezing me this morning and keep holding to this sweet, sweet Christ. The exhortation from the writer of Hebrews is, therefore, in light of all that Christ has done, run this race with endurance. The therefore is pointing back to all of that, the finished work of Christ and his person is superior. And the application has been then to believe. It's exhorting the church of God to believe. To, to not just know the doctrines of Christ, to believe them. To, to look at these and receive them and to entrust your soul to them. It's, it's a call to faith. Look at Hebrews 11.1, 1, one of the fa most famous verses that we know. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the promise of God. And it's the conviction of things not seen. I, I know this to be true and I live upon it. And the whole chapter is going to show people who live by faith and believe what God says. And, and they live with a conviction in the scene of the unseen God and his promises. And so faith lays hold of these things. It's the assurance that this is mine. I have salvation. I have Christ. I'm back with God. I have peace with him. That's my faith. And in verse 6, without faith, you can't please them. You will never please God by just being a good moral person, going to church, cleaning yourself up. It will never please him. The only thing that can ever please this God is faith. And the one who believes in what he says and what is true and what he's done and what he will do, that's how you're going to please this God. And so it's by faith. And then he gives us the hall of fame of faith in chapter 11. And they all believed God's word. They took him at it. And, and they would not let anything seen replace what they were running to in Christ, the promised Messiah. They wouldn't be moved away from anything. Noah will build an ark for 300 years and not take his, uh, his mind or heart off the promise of God. Abraham, you're going to have a seed that the nations will be blessed and you're 100 years old and your wife is 90 and I won't quit believing. I won't waver in unbelief. Moses says, I'm going to give up all the riches of Egypt so that I can have the, the, the people of God and suffer with them. He says there's going to be people who are persecuted in Son and two. They hoped for a better resurrection, their faith. They looked for the city whose maker and builder was God, which is the finish line. And so this whole thing is a, a, a call to faith. The, the application of all that Christ has done is believe it and rest in it and live then with a conviction of what these things are and that they're true. And the race that's set before you is to run it with faith, to believe these things that have been told and revealed to us in the word of God. So run by faith to the finish line. That's what this writer is saying. So, what I want to look at this morning, and I'm out of practice, I didn't send my outline to Jana, so you're just going to have to take it in without visual, okay? And I promised Jordan I'd put up a picture, I'm saving that for next week. <coughs> so I want to look at this morning is that to run this race that's set before us with endurance, we need some help. And so we need help. Every one of you, I hope, are saying, I want to do that, I want to do that. Give me some help. And so the writer of Hebrews is going to give us two ways to do that, and I'm going to make it simple. He's going to say, put off some things and put on some things, just kind of like Ephesians. And so let's take a look at put off and put on. So look with me in verse 1. What do we got to put off? Let us also lay aside 
every encumbrance in the sin which so easily entangles us. And so just a good metaphor to running. You just don't see people in marathons running with big backpacks and suitcases. Have you ever seen the Olympics in the 100-yard dash? Hussein Bolt walking out with a backpack on. Here's my suitcase. See if I can win. You'd laugh at them. That's what you do when you're on vacation, right? I went to Europe one time with this suitcase bigger than anyone in this room. This thing was huge, and one of the wheels was broken. And, and you got to get on and off, and you're always on the move, and everyone had these little cute suitcases, and they're <laughs> popping on and off trams and trains, and I'm lugging this thing, on, ka-kunk, 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 and, and they're just dodging people, and I'm hitting everybody with this big <laughs> suitcase. I'm not taking that to the race. If you're going to run, you got to put off the things that are going to trip you up and the things that are going to entangle you in this race, and there's some things that are going to hinder you and this beautiful race that's been set before you by God. And the first thing is you've got to put off every encumbrance. The, the Greek word means weights or bulk. Put off these weights or these bulky things that are weighing. They, they weigh us down as we're trying to run. And what we could call it maybe the scene, the world. The, I think I would say anything that takes our eyes off of Christ. Anything that moves your eyes off of him, they're they're weights. And they make us think, as the writer says, I think in this chapter, that here we have no lasting city. No, it's chapter 13. We we have no lasting city here. Our race is, 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 is not the one with the most toys wins. Our race is not pleasures and comforts and try to find ease in a home with two kids and a dog. Our race is not the corporate ladder. It's not, I'm just going to make a difference with my life. You know what? That's not your race. Weights are, are like our own plans. Uh, I'm going to be successful as the world defines it. And you have all these weights that the world has placed on you, and you're trying to run this race, and you're exhausted because you're just looking at all these other things and giving your life to them. That's all you can think about. I got to have a husband and it's a weight that just weighs on me every day and just waits. And what are the things that make us tired in the race and weary and make you want to just give up? Greg talked about it this morning. It's my favorite word. Do you remember? Epithumias. Thumia, for anyone new this morning, means desire. And epi means over. And so these weights, the sin, is their desires for good things, bad things, excellent things, but they're an over desire because you want them more than Christ. And anything that you're sitting here saying, I gotta have more than Christ, uh, it's, it's a weight that's weighing you down and it's keeping you from running the race that's set before you and your sweet God will remove them and he'll bring trials and you'll be like, why are you doing this? To get these weights off you so you can run the race that is set before you. Whenever I feel exhausted in the race, I find that encumbrances are on me and my eyes have been taken off of Christ. He said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I pray for more Christians whose yoke is easy and your burden is light because you're looking to Christ. And these other things, uh, before I went on sabbatical, I felt weary and tired And as God sorted me out, there were things that were weighing on me that shouldn't have. And my eyes were looking at things that were tiring me out. You can have the weight of just wanting approval, the weight of of acceptance, of body beautiful, of being fashionable, uh, the weight of sin, the weight of school. My hope is that my education is going to make my race easier. The weight of my dream, that the things that I want to accomplish, all of these things, I'm telling you, they will make you tired and weary. All I want is uh, financial freedom, and that weight sits on you daily. And these weights can just come and sit. Uh, I just want to do great things for the kingdom of God, and they will sit and weigh on you and, and, and be heavy, as Ray talked about last week, how not to do that. When you're chasing the world, that is not the race that has been set before you. It will hinder your running. And you'll be weary of running to Jesus. Your, your legs just feel so heavy because of the encumbrances. And, and they, they, they got to be thrown off if you're ever going to run this race. 
And just a note, there is a difference between a hard race that has been set before you and an idol. One is a hard race with persecution and trials within and fears without, all of these things that are coming at you, that's normal. But when you get an idol, I'm telling you, the weariness and the heaviness and the difficulty of the race will begin to take you down. I can never be happy without this person or this thing, this encumbrance. Let us shepherd you out of that. If you're always tired and weary and sad and downtrodden, you have an encumbrance that's called an idol, that's called an epithumia, that's sitting upon you. And I, I want to set you free from that for the joy of running the race that was set before you. Jesus says in verse two or three that it was his joy that was set before him to run his race. It was a great joy to come and accomplish redemption for his people. Second, we, I hope I'm not going too long. I, I feel kind of full, so be, be patient. We've got to put off the encumbrances, and now we've got to put off the sin which so easily entangles us. That, that's a, a frightening phrase. It, it so easily entangles us. It, wow, this is something that trips us up quite easily. The word here is, is not used anywhere else in the Bible. It's not used in classical Greek author around that time, any of them. None, none of them use it. And so we must rely solely on the context, lexical and context study to say, what does this word mean? And it is that, uh, that sin, that it, it's always there. It's getting us entangled, and he says it's easily. So I'm trying to take what it says. It, it trips me up, and it it's, does it like nothing. If, if, if the guy or girl running, I picture it with, have you ever seen those long dangling sweats? You know, picture someone with sweats that are too big, and they're bell-bottomed, and they're trying to run the race that's set. You're just going to trip the whole way. There's no way you can run with these things, and that's kind of the picture here. Is that there's something that's just big and dangling and gets your feet tripped up like this, and you, you're just running with all your heart, and next thing you know, you're falling on your face every couple minutes. And he's saying, you've got to put these off. Take your sweats off. Peel them off. And I've, I've tried to get this so many times, and I've changed over the decades what this means, but here's my bottom line. I think it's indwelling sin, and I think it has an emphasis on the outworking of unbelief, because I look at the context and everything, it's in the Hall of Fame of Faith context. Therefore, uh, after all their faith, that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, and, and I think the root of all sin is unbelief. You know, it's pride, but pride, pride comes from unbelief, because you don't believe the truth about God and that you're better. And so I, I really think this root sin of unbelief causes Every sin that you do, if you look at any sin you're battling this morning, I think we could get back to the root cause. It's you don't believe this gospel. There, there's an unbelief that that will make me happier. This is what I really need instead of Christ. So this unbelief, it's, it just entangles us again and again and again because I don't believe the gospel and I start believing what's thrown before me from this world. And as I take it, it just keeps tripping me up. And our, our context of chapter 11, uh, it's the sin which seeks to hinder faith. And so, uh, write these verses down. I'm, just, I'm not going to read them all. Hebrews 3.19, 4.2, 4.16, 6.11, and 10.19 through 23. And they all talk about this fight against unbelief and this battle of holding to faith. And I think that's what he's talking about. As we run this race, I've got to fight for faith. And I've got to fight the lies of unbelief and what they tempt me to. And, and when he gives our remedy, I think it will tie in perfectly and you'll see why I'm leaning toward this. So we can't, we can't be tripped up by unbelief because it just so easily entangles us. Unbelief will trip you faster than anything. It's just big oversized sweats. And so I, I've had the, the best quiet time and when I finish, I just want to run this race. I want to run to Jesus. He's lovely. That's all I care about. And the next thing I know, I'm lying on the track, tripped on unbelief with a cut up chin from falling. So here lies the battle of the Christian life. As Paul says, you've got to fight the good fight of faith. So here's all of our battle is we've got to fight the fight of faith. We've got to do everything, all discipline, everything possible to rest in Christ alone. I've got to fight to rest. And so here is the call right here is you've got to put off that sin that so easily trips you up with faith, with faith, looking to Christ. 
And so here's my sabbatical. Was that too long of an introduction? <laughs> okay, here's what I learned. I want to run. And I just keep getting tripped up. And I have so many encumbrances that can make me tired of fears and idols. And my question is, is this the Christian life of just three steps forward, two back, and just always tripping? 30 years of running, and sometimes you look back and you say, is the, is the growth what I really want to see? Have you ever felt like you're running on a treadmill? <laughs> you're just running and running, and you look down, I just ran six miles, and I'm still in the exact same place. <laughs> That's why I want to give you an answer now is you gotta put something off, but you gotta put on something, and what we're gonna put on is how we're gonna put off. And so I want to, to show you, to run this race, there's something you gotta put on. And two things. The first one he says in verse one, <clears throat> since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and who, who's this cloud of witnesses? Well, it's chapter 11. It's the hall of fame of faith and Abraham and Noah and all, all that he had pointed to. And what he's telling us here now is you're running a race and these guys are seated in heaven, which we'll call the stadium, and they're there just cheering us on. You know, the, the crowd saying, go, go. And they're, they're yelling, you know, at, at some point, every one of us blew it, but we made it. We're there. Uh, they, they got to the finish line and they're telling you it's worth it. It was worth everything we gave up, every denial, uh, even being sawn in two, everything was worth what we have found in Christ. Keep running. Don't get led astray with the encumbrances and the sin that so easily entangles. Keep running. I promise you it, it's worth it. John Brown, the commentator, says it's as if we are in the arena and there are thousands upon thousand friendly voices seeming to proclaim, so run that you may obtain. We once struggled as you now struggled, and you shall conquer as we have conquered. Onward, onward. They're just cheering us on. Isn't that great to have that? I love it. I love Hebrews 11. I love these men and women and children just cheering me on. I just, I want to give them all hugs when I get to glory. Thank you. You cheered me on on hard days. And yet some days, their cheering is hurting me <laughs> because they got somewhere. I read that chapter of Hall of Fame and I'm like, oh, my name wouldn't be in that chapter. They ran well and, and we see their progress and we watch their amazing feats, shutting the mouths of lions and all these things. They did it by faith. And sometimes it becomes an encumbrance to me because I, I look at them, I'm like, oh, I'm missing it so bad. I had a guy leave the church last year because I shared about a victory that one of my boys had as an illustration to encourage. And, and, and he said he's just, his kids were struggling and he's tired of me sticking it in his face from the pulpit. And I thought I was encouraging him. And, and all my faith was doing was making him feel like trash. Hebrews 11, shutting mouths of lions. I can't, it's amazing, they shut mouths of lions. And I can't shut my mouth to quit eating too many carbs. I love pizza and gelato. Okay, there it is. <laughs> I want to run faster, better, longer, more like Christ with great endurance. There just has to be something more. I need more than putting off obstacles and sin which so easily entangles. I, I fight that. I do it every day. I need more than faithful saints encouraging me. Though I like it. I like biographies. I like you guys. I like Hebrews 11. It helps. I just need something more. And I walked into sabbatical. I crawled. And I didn't realize how many encumbrances were weighing on me, how many fears and unbeliefs. And here's what God showed me clearer than ever and sweeter than ever. And these are not just words. These are the words of life. They're life-giving to the soul. And they're the key to the running the race that has been set before us. And I proclaim this to you with all of my heart. And I desire for everyone in this room to fulfill this command. And if you'll look with me in verse 2. We're to run the race. How? 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the application of the I am's. In a race, the runner's got to fix his eyes on the finish line, right? If you run a 100-yard dash and you're checking out everybody, how, are, are they beating me? Are they not? You're going to trip. There's one, every runner knows you fix your eyes on one thing, the finish line. And there's a place that we must fix our eyes as we run the race that has been set before us, and it's not looking backwards. It's not looking at all your past sins and everything that you've committed and being stuck in the mud because you, you can't find true forgiveness for what you've done. It's not looking beside you at, you know, how's he doing? How's she doing? How fast are they running? Am I like them? Uh, it's not looking sideways. It's not looking inward at all of my remaining corruptions and just staring at navel gazing all day long. Just all I look at is me. You'll, you'll never run the race that's set before you. It's not looking 100 yards forward and, and, unless it's a 100-yard dash. So let's say it's a 220. Uh, so you, it's not looking 100 yards at all of your resolutions. This is what I'm going to do for Jesus. Here's my new changes. Here's my new leaf I'm going to turn over. That isn't going to get it done. There's only one place the believer must fix his gaze when he runs this race, and this place is a person. <laughs> It's a person that in chapter one, he said, is the radiance of God's glory. He's the, the brilliance of all that God is. He, he is the exact representation. He's God. He's the bread, the shepherd, the way, the truth, the life, the vine, the door, the water, all that we looked at. He's the Savior and the Lord. This person we're to fix our eyes on, and that makes the, the burdens light, and it melts unbelief. It's the only way to run this race. It takes the weary and it makes them like eagles. And they will run and they will not grow weary as they look at this Christ. <laughs> he sweetens every step in their race. He motivates our heart to keep running and to never give up. A sight of Christ by faith and I find full sufficiency of everything that I need for life and godliness. So as I look to him, he, 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 he's, he's sufficient for everything that I need looking to Jesus. I'll never forget when I met my wife, Laura. We met in high school. And all of a sudden, there was a little joy in my step. The grass was greener and the sky was bluer. I, I never wake up when my alarm goes off. I used to sleep an hour past it every day in high school. Could you ever get enough sleep in high school? I never could. And all of a sudden, we went to the same school. So when the alarm went off, man, I was out of bed in one second because she was waiting for me at school. And I remember just classes, I used to endure geography and geometry and all those classes because I saw her at the end of them. My race as an unbeliever, the race that was set before me got easier because of her beauty. How much more the lovely Christ. He sweetens every step. I love running to Jesus. And it doesn't say to take a look at Christ and be saved, justified, and move on. That, that's everywhere in the church today. Get saved. I'm done with Jesus. Now let's go live moral lives. This word is a present tense. Fixing continuously again and again and again your eyes upon this Christ. This is the believer's constant and daily charge if you're wanting to quit, give up. If you're inordinately weary this morning, you quit looking. You start looking at your circumstances, your sin. You're looking at something other than this full, sufficient Christ who gives salvation again and again and again. Justification, sanctification, glorification. You quit looking. That's what a midlife crisis is. Quit looking at Jesus and I got to find something to make me happy. And so at the time we got left... I'm going to try to flush this out because this is all I looked at. I got three months, thank you, to just look my eyes out. And I apologize. Before I left, I was stuck on John Newton. Do you remember? I had more time to read and meditate on his book. And so 
I'm going to share more about John Newton. But it, I, this could be it for a while. So the conclusion he said of all of his years, John Newton, if you don't know who he is, he was the writer of Amazing Grace. And, you know, he, he did so many horrible, horrific things with slave trade and all of that. And he got radically converted. And he was an amazing minister. And he tried to sum up the whole Christian life of all that he learned. And he said it was this, looking to Jesus. Looking to Jesus. And I will stand with that witness and say amen. And so here's my conclusion. The great privilege and duty of the Christian life is looking to Jesus. It is your greatest privilege. The beginning of the Christian life, it says he's the author of faith. And so in all of my sin and all of my brokenness, I look to Christ as the remedy and the healer. And then I look to him as the end goal of the Christian life, the gain where I get more of Christ. I'm, I'm fixed and focused on the, the finish line as I get Christ in abundance. And looking to him then is the daily privilege of the Christian's life. He's the perfecter of faith. He's going to perfect it and grow it. And so you're just never going to outgrow the gospel. You're always going to be living into seeing the beauties and the glories of Christ, looking to him. You can't look away. You can't say, okay, I got this. It's, it's a daily looking, abiding him. He's everything. It's, it's, it's a, a, a run of faith as I look at both advents. I just, I'm running with this in mind. I'm right before God because of the work of Christ. I can never get over that. I live in that. I got to fight to believe it. And I live on this other end. What's coming? There's a consummation that's getting closer and closer where I'm going to be brought into a new heavens and a new earth with Christ. And if you will keep those two advents looking to Jesus, you, you, these obstacles are going to fall off and the sin that so easily entangles you isn't going to get a hold because you're looking to Jesus. And so what is faith? I'm going to give you a quote from John Newton. Faith is the effect of a principle of new life implanted in the soul. That was before dead and trespasses and sins and it qualifies not only for obeying the Savior's precepts, but chiefly and primarily for receiving and rejoicing in his fullness, admiring his love, his work, his person, his glory, and his advocacy. It makes Christ precious. It enthrones him in a heart, and it presents him as the most delightful object to our meditations as our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our strength, our root, our head, our life, our shepherd, and our husband. It's just seeing Christ for all that he is, looking to him, and your heart now is taken up with it. Academic doctrine is not faith. You must have doctrine, but it must show you what he just said. Christ is beautiful. He's everything to me. He's my shepherd. I love him. He's my advocate. I just can't quit looking at him. He's everything. Just die to this fake Christian life that doesn't look at Jesus and just gets his, some of his doctrines and goes to a church and you never grow because you're not beholding Christ and becoming more like him. This race is a race to look at Christ and find your full glory and beauty and hope in him. And the grace of God is that our chief command in life is to look at him. Aren't you glad that he didn't say, look at me? <laughs> Look at church. Look at Jesus. This is the most gracious, sweet command that a God could ever give to his people. It just simplifies the Christian life in this race. Newton said in a, a song, but since the Savior I have known, my rules are all reduced to one. To keep my Lord by faith in view, this strength supplies and motives to. I find my strength looking to him and I find my motives to want to run the race that has been set before me. The Christian faith is to see the full sufficiency of Christ. All that he is, all that he's given to us in our race, looking to Jesus. And, and the duty, the privilege, the safety, the unspeakable happiness of a believer are all comprised in that one participle phrase, looking to Jesus. This is the preeminent Christian discipline. It's a present tense participle. It's the only way that you can run the race that is set before you. 
And I'll just tell you straight up, if you're running the race, looking to your own merit, what you can do to get Jesus to like you or love you more, you haven't entered the race. If you're looking at your own accomplishments, you're gonna die. If you're looking at all of your service to the king, if you're looking at missions work, the fruit of your family, your goals, your moral reform, your, even your sanctification. If you're looking at all of these things, you're just gonna trip and you're gonna get encumbrances and sin that's gonna easily entangle you. It's just this beautiful sanctifying call, looking to Jesus. That's the finish line. That's the Christian life. Looking to, to this full, sufficient, beautiful, altogether lovely Savior. Newton said, one believing sight of him will do more to restore peace in the conscience and life to our graces than all our lamentations and resolutions. All our weeping, all of our things we're gonna change, just one look at him will do more for you than all of that stuff. And so I want you to hear this really clearly. All of your disciplines are no good if they become a substitute for looking at Christ. I know people who look more at their disciplines than they look at Christ. And I want you to, to let that arrow go right in if that's you. But don't look to your disciplines. Let your disciplines make you look at Christ. So quite simply, what God showed me on my break is how do we fight the sin which so easily entangles us? How do we put off encumbrances that are so loud in my ears? And it's just a simple little answer that I've known since I was saved. <laughs> Looking, a believing view of Jesus has the power to mortify remaining sin and your self-will, and God will teach you that. A life focused on Christ is a life of faith, and Newton said it's a life opposite to a life focused on self, self-sufficiency, and self-wisdom. All of this self that's going to change and sanctify, and it's saying, look at Christ, look at Christ. So in everything, guys, looking to him, all sufficiency, he's all for us. What, what a marriage. And where do I see him? I get in his word, and he's the fulfillment of, of the whole Bible. And I just look my eyes out in this Bible, and I just keep digging in. And by faith, I just keep seeing the beauty and the glory of that Christ. I, I need a quiet time, not because a scripture a day keeps the devil away, but because I see Christ, and I look. I just keep looking in this word and, and I just keep seeing him as altogether lovely. I, I find no defects in him. I just marvel at who this beautiful Christ is. It just makes me want to run. So if this is the key to the Christian life, and it is, where do you think your enemy is going to spend the most time against you? <laughs> Pretty simple, huh? To keep you from looking by faith to Christ. And so I'll just let you know, this is the simplest thing I've ever done. I love it. And it's the most difficult thing that I've ever done in my life, to fight the fight of faith and keep myself looking believingly at these sweet promises with everything around me. And I'm going to quote Newton one more time. If I may speak from my own experience, he said, I find that to keep my eye simply upon Christ as my peace in my life is by far the hardest part of my calling. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. And the battle to make Jesus my all and all, all hell is set against it. And so I want you to, to take this and what I'm learning as I go into this world, anywhere I go where I know there's temptations or weaknesses or anything, I just walk and as I'm going in, I'm, I'm looking at that I'm, I'm loved by God in Christ. He has saved me and justified me. And I start thinking about what's coming. What's my hope? What's he going to give me in this new heavens and new earth? And I walk in, I'm like, all this food isn't going to tempt me because I got everything coming in Christ. There's not some new pizza that Totino's came up with or whatever that's going to be better than what's coming here at the end. And if you will walk by faith and run this race looking to him, I'm telling you what this does in the fight of faith is unbelievable. But this is where we got to discipline and fight and help each other and preach each other to Christ again and again in our trials and whatever we're facing. Is any good counselor, just give him Jesus. Oh, look, look your eyes out at Christ. 
So daily, looking to him, the beauty of who he is and what he's done and what he is doing uh, and what he will do is the call to Christian life. So I'm going to close out and I'm going to be really quick because I'm going long. A few thoughts. Because this one's important to me. Is it, the, most people think he's writing about these isthmus games, which we would call like the Olympic games. And you would, you would run the race and the only way you could be in these Olympics and run is if you were a citizen. And so I want you to catch this. You did not get in the Olympics and run and try to win to become a citizen. You could only run it because you were a citizen. And so where I want to close is if there's anyone in here this morning and you're trying to work hard and be a better person and start going to church and reading your Bible, and you're trying to get yourself right with God, you'll, you'll never get it through that means. And God has given you a means to reconcile you back to himself to save you this morning. And he, he crucified his own son on a cross where he was being killed for the sins that we committed. And he, and, and he lifts them up. He raises them from the dead. And he says, all you do is you look at him and you'll live. Look away from anything in yourself to clean yourself up, to fix you, to atone for your sin. And all he wants you to do is sitting here in the quietness of your heart is by faith just look at Christ dying in your place. And he says, though your sins were scarlet, they'll be made as white as snow. I'll separate them as far as the east is from the west. So I, I ask you this morning, if, if you're in that place, just look. Look at Christ by faith and be forgiven this very moment. And secondly, for the believer, just keep looking. Present tense participle. He is your righteousness and your acceptance. And you can't run this race without believing that. You, it's so easy to drift from that and start looking at your own righteousness. I'm telling you, there's a righteousness that's perfect and God's given it to you by grace through faith to your account. Your sin and your fa failings do not take his love and his commitment away from you. And so just again, look at the sufficiency of Christ this morning as a believer for whatever you're facing, whatever, whatever it is, if, if there's sin this morning, you repent. Just look at Christ. And then for our, our spiritual growth, as there was this big movement in America, WWJD, what would Jesus do? And they were on these little bands that were really cool. I liked them. But what, what I want to hit is that Jesus came and he walked a path. He ran the race that was set before him, and he said for the joy that was set before him, he, he, he walked this path, he ran this race, and that was to go and go up on a cross and die in our place for our sins of his people. And so that, that is the, the path that he ran. And what I want you to see then is that's my path. Where he is seated right now, that's where I'm running. That's the, where my eyes are fixed. That's how I get to him. The way I get to Jesus is the path that he blazed and he showed us what perfect son of God lives like, perfect humanity. He's, he blazed a trail that's beautiful and I want to run the race. I want to take that path because it gets to Jesus. Not, I just want to imitate him. That, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's bigger than that. I, I want something more than just, I, I want to try to imitate him. I want him and this is the path to get to him. This is the, the way we got to walk. And I want to walk the path that gets to Christ. What motivation to obedience? What more do you need than that? I'm running to Christ on the path that he took to be pleasing to his father. And any deviation from that path, you know what I hate about it? It's away from him. Doesn't that make you hate sin just a little bit more? I'm running to Christ. I want him. And every time I deviate, I'm going away from him. Oh God, let me repent and change my thinking and believe again and get restored back to Christ and I'm running to him. So I got to run the way he ran. I got to live the way he lived. I'm, I'm journeying down that blazed path because I want what's at the end of it. That sweet Christ. And he gives endurance no matter what your race is today and how hard the course, how weary or broken. He gives endurance uh, as you look to the sweet Christ. Uh, verse four, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. He will give us the endurance to abide under, to remain under, no matter how weary or tired you are, 
this morning. Just fix your eyes again on Jesus. What a beautiful command that God's given to every child of God. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. God, I thank you for a command to look at the most beautiful thing in the universe. I thank you that what we get to look at is the Lord Jesus Christ who lived the life I should have and died the death I deserved. I thank you for this sweet Christ. And I thank you that he's at the end of this race. And God, that gives me endurance. That gives me everything. All sufficiency to run this race is in the one I'm looking at. And he will give me everything that I need to run this race. He'll give me his wisdom and his righteousness and his sanctification. He will give it to us. God, let us fix our eyes on him. Let us look to him for all strength and power and transformation. Let him be our all in all. Let him be the joy of our heart, the north star of every heart here this morning. God, if we've grown so weary, we're going to quit. Pray, refresh that heart this morning and let him look again at a Christ who washes and forgives wanderings and backslidings and, and just, again, comforts and puts us on that race, that sweet race to him. And I thank you that you won't lose any of your runners on this track. Oh God, renew the weary, restore their souls, and let them run in the path of righteousness because it's a path that leads to the sweet, sweet Jesus Christ. And it's in that beautiful name that we do pray this morning. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.